The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume 1, Chapter 16. My maid became every day more haughty, seeing that her scoldings and outcries did not now torment me. She thought if she could hinder me from going to the communion, she would give me the greatest of all vexations. She was not mistaken. O oh, divine spouse of few souls, since the only satisfaction of my life was to receive and to honor thee, I gave everything of the finest I had to furnish the churches with ornaments and contributed to the utmost extent of my abilities to make them have silver plates and chalices oh my love i cried let me be thy victim spare nothing to annihilate me i felt an inexpressible longing to be more reduced and to become as it were nothing this girl then knew my affection for the holy sacrament where when i could have liberty for it i passed several hours on my knees she took it in her head to watch me daily when she discovered me going she ran to tell my mother-in-law and my husband they needed no more to chagrin them the invectives lasted for whole day if a word escaped me in my own justification it was enough to make them say that i was guilty of sacrilege and to raise an outcry against all devotion if i made them no answer at all they still heightened their indignation and said the most grating things that they could devise if i fell sick which often happened they took occasion to come to quarrel with me at my bed saying my communion and prayers were what made me sick they spoke as if there had been nothing else could make me ill but my devotion to thee o oh, my beloved she told me one day that she was going to write to my director to get him to stop me from going to the communion when i made no answer she cried out as loud as she could that i treated her ill and despised her when i went to prayers though i had taken care to arrange everything about the house she ran to tell my husband that I was going, and I had left nothing in order. When I returned home, his rage fell on me in all its violence. They would hear none of my reasons, but said they were all a pack of lies. My mother-in-law persuaded my husband that I let everything go to wreck if she did not take the care of things he would be ruined he believed it and i bore all with patience endeavoring as well as i could to do my duty what gave most trouble was not knowing what course to take for when i ordered anything without her she complained that i showed her no respect that i did things of my own head and that they were done always the worse for it then she would order them contrary if i consulted her to know what or how she would have anything to be done she said that i compel her to have the care and trouble of everything i had scarcely any rest but what I found in the love of thy will. O oh my God, and submission to thy orders, however 
rigorous they might be. They incessantly watched my words and actions to find occasion against me. They chided me all the day long, continually repeating and harping over and over the same things, even before the servants. How often have I made my meals on my tears, which were interpreted as the most criminal in the world. They said I would be damned, as if the tears would open hell for me, which surely they were more likely to extinguish. If I recited anything I had heard, they would render me accountable for the truth of it. If I kept silence, they taxed me with contempt and perverseness. If I knew anything without telling it, that was a crime. If I told it, then they said I had forged it. Sometimes they tormented me for several days successively without giving me any relaxation. The girls said I ought to feign sickness to get a little rest. I made no reply. The love of God so closely possessed me that it would not allow me to seek relief by a single word or even by a look. Sometimes I said in myself, Oh, that I had but any one who could take notice of me or to whom I might unburden myself, what a relief it could be to me. But it was not granted me. Yet, if I happened to be for some days free from the exterior cross, it was a most sensible distress to me, and indeed a punishment more difficult to bear than the severest trials. I then comprehended what St. Teresa says, Let me suffer or die. For this absence of the cross was so grievous to me that I languished with desire for its return. But no sooner was this earnest longing granted and the blessed cross returned again than, strange as it may seem, it appeared so weight and so burdensome as to be almost insupportable. Though I loved my father extremely, and he loved me tenderly, yet I never spoke to him of my sufferings. One of my relations, who loved me very much, perceived the little moderation they used toward me, they spoke very roughly to me before him. He was highly displeased and told my father of it, adding that I would pass for a fool. Soon after, I went to see my father, who, contrary to his custom, sharply reprimanded me for suffering them to treat me in such a manner without saying anything in my own defense. I answer, if they knew what my husband said to me, that was confusion enough for me, without my bringing any more of it on myself by replies, that if they did not notice it, I ought not to cause it to be observed, nor expose my husband's weakness that remaining silent stopped all disputes, whereas I might cause them to be continued and increased by my replies. My father answered that I did well, and that I should continue to act as God should inspire me, and after that he never spoke to me of it any more. They were ever talking to me against my father, against my relations, and all such as I esteemed most. I felt this more keenly, 
than all they could say against myself. I could not forbear defending them, and therein I did wrong, as whatever I said served only to provoke them. If any complained of my father or relations, they were always in the right. If any whom they had disliked before spoke against them, they were presently approved it. If any showed friendship to me, such were not welcome. A relation whom I greatly loved for her piety, coming to see me, they openly bid her be gone. They treated her in such a manner as obliged her to go, which gave me no small uneasiness. When any person of distinction came, they would speak against me, even to those who knew me not, which surprised them. But when they saw me, they pitied me. It mattered not what they said against me. Love would not allow me to justify myself. I spoke not to my husband of what either my mother-in-law or the girl did to me, except the first year, when I was not sufficiently touched with the power of God to suffer. My mother-in-law and my husband often quarreled. Then I was in favor, and to me they made their mutual complaints. I never told the one what the other had said, and though it might have been of service to me, humanly speaking, to take advantage of such opportunities, I never made use of them to complain of either. Nay, on the contrary, I did not rest till I had reconciled them. I spoke many obliging things of the one to the other, which made them friends again. I knew by frequent experience that I should pay dear for their reunion. Scarcely were they reconciled when they joined together against me. I was so deeply engaged within, as often to forget things without, yet not anything which was of consequence. My husband was hasty, and inattention frequently irritated him. I walked into the garden without observing anything, when my husband, who could not go thither, asked me about it. I knew not what to say, at which he was angry. I went thither on purpose to notice everything, in order to tell him, and yet, when there I did not think of looking. I went ten times one day to see and bring him an account, and yet forgot it. But when I did remember to look, I was much pleased. Yet it happened, I was then asked nothing about them. All my crosses to me would have seemed little if I might have had liberty to pray and to be alone to indulge the interior attraction which I felt, but I was obliged to continue in their presence with such a subjection as is scarcely conceivable. My husband looked at his watch. If at any time I had liberty allowed me for prayer to see if I stayed more than half an hour, if I exceeded, he grew very uneasy. Sometimes I said, Grant me one hour to divert and employ myself as I had a mind. Though 
he would have granted it to me for other diversions, yet for prayer he would not. I confess that experience caused me much trouble. I have often thereby given occasion for what they made me suffer. For oh, I not to have looked on my capacity as an effect of the will of God to content myself and to make it my only desire and prayer? But I often fell back again into the anxiety of wishing to get time for prayer, which was not agreeable to my husband. Those faults were more frequent in the beginning. Afterward, I prayed to God in his own retreat, in the temple of my heart, and I went out no more. End of Volume 1, Chapter 16